Okay guys, so this is about landlord basics. So many of you have written in and asked these questions about you know, some of the things that you know. I've been in the property management business for about 30 years and we have a very large property management company that manages all of our properties. So we manage self storage, commercial, apartments, vacant land, new construction, you name it. We've been around the real estate business a long time. So these are six landlord basics that you just cannot afford not to know. And if you find any value in these videos, just hit subscribe and like, because other people just like you are trying to find good information out there on YouTube. So thank you. Number one, remember this is a business. So this is not a stock. It's not something that you can just invest in and walk away from. This is a full on business. This has income and it has expense. Your tenants are your clients. They are not necessarily your friends. Now, it's good to be friendly, but you need to be able to treat them more like clients. And the lease is the contract between the two of you. You need to know that there's going to be difficult conversations coming up. This is your money or somebody else's money that's invested and you guys are gonna be looking for some kind of a return. So there's rent collection and management of the expenses and real bookkeeping, and that financial statement or that income statement is your report card, don't forget. Number two, be super clear on your policies and procedures. So at our properties, we always have a separate document of policies and procedures around clubhouse use, around the pool use, around loud music, around parking, around all kinds of things that are gonna happen at your property or inside of your community. You're gonna have things in there like, who takes care of the landscape? Is it the tenant or is it you? Can they have pets? And if they do, then you need another pet policy. And that pet policy will outline things like sizes, the numbers, the breeds, all those kinds of things need to be inside of that new policy, but that's certainly a policy. What about smoking? What about smoking inside of the unit? I know for a fact that we've had plenty of smokers in our units and afterwards, those are some of the toughest units to clean because of the residue on the walls, et cetera, et cetera. And so do you have enough money to be able to cover those kinds of repairs after they move out? How many cars do they have? I know we had a property in Flagstaff, Arizona that was near a university and each two bedroom unit sometimes had four kids in them and each kid had a car. So you have four cars for one apartment. All you have to do is the math to know that there's not enough parking for something like that. So cars can be a big thing in many, many locations, especially where there's limited parking like downtown in some urban areas and things like that. So make sure that you have the make model, license plate number and all those things. And in some cases, even stickers for their cars so that you know exactly who's parking where and when. Can they park their work van or their truck at your community or maybe trailers or boats or those kinds of things? You know, those are usually extra parking and they can take up a lot of your open spaces, which then restrict the parking for your guests. These are all things that need to be inside of your policies and procedures. Who's gonna pay for the electric, the water, the sewer, the trash? Is it you, is it the tenant? On some master metered buildings, it might be the landlord. On some non-master metered buildings, it might be the tenant. That needs to be all clear inside of your policies and procedures and even sometimes inside of your leases. Sometimes new landlords forget all these small little details and when they come up later, it's very, very difficult to enforce these things because they're not in your policies and procedures that are signed and they're not in your lease that is signed. Number three, if you put it into your lease, be ready to enforce it. Remember, you have to perform and enforce the contract. So the areas of dispute around leases are typically the following. Things like rent, when is it due? Things like the late fee, which a lot of times you need to enforce. If you don't enforce the late fee, then you're basically setting the precedence for the resident to pay late each and every month. You need to enforce that late fee. If they pay you with a check, and it bounces, it's called an NSF or non-sufficient funds. You need to be aware of the fees that the bank may charge you in addition to the late fee that the resident might owe and those have to be enforced. During the lease, you're going to see all kinds of crazy things. You're gonna see roommates come and go. 
you're going to see subletting. You're going to see new pets. You're going to see new cars. You're going to see boats, trailers. You're going to see damage. You're going to see all kinds of things. These things are all in your lease. They need to be in force and you need to take care of them immediately, especially if you have other tenants in the community because sometimes residents can be disruptive and chase off a lot of your good tenants. So make sure that you're enforcing things inside of your lease and you're taking care of them right away. So if you put it into the lease, make sure that you guys enforce it. The fourth thing, the security deposit. By far, the security deposit is the most misunderstood and the biggest issue, especially when people move in and when people move out. What I always suggest that you do is fill out a move-in form, which you can find on kenmacroy.com under forms. And this form needs to be very, very detailed and specific. So just like when you guys have got a rental car and you walk around the car and you take a look at all the little things that the car might have on it because you don't want to be charged when you return that car, the same is true for an apartment or a rental. You want to make sure that the landlord and the tenant sign off on a move-in form so that everything's disclosed. Let's say there's a, a cigarette burn in the countertop that it's on there or there's a nick in the bathtub for example, that was not repaired and that it's on there so that you as the tenant are not charged by the landlord and that the landlord also knows that you as, as the tenant did not do the damage. This is a very, very important form, especially as it pertains to when you're trying to get your deposit back or when the landlord's trying to give you your deposit back. I always suggest on a move out that the landlord or the manager always takes lots of photos. Take photos of everything that you're going to charge that tenant for, whether it's the cleaning or the maintenance or any kind of repairs, because it's very, very, very important, not only written documentation, but photo documentation, because I guarantee you that the tenant is going to have a very different viewpoint with you as the landlord or the manager on what you need to do in order to get that unit rent ready for the next tenant for move in. You guys are going to have very different opinions on this and the difference is typically going to be taken out of the deposit in order to fix those kinds of things so that you can re-rent the unit and so you guys are going to have issues around the carpet repairs or the carpet cleaning or the unit paint or all those kinds of things, all these little things that a tenant may not see that you see immediately that you're going to need to do. And don't forget, when a tenant moves out by law, Every state is a little bit different. You have to notify them in writing of exactly the detail of what you're going to do if you're going to hold any portion of their deposit. And by law, in most states, you have to have their deposits back to them somewhere between 14 and 30 days, depending on the state. So be very aware of that. So right when they move out, you need to go into the unit. You need to make sure that you do your inspections. You need to make sure you do all the itemization of everything that you need done. And you need to try to get all that work done in that short period of time. So it's part of that documentation when you send it out to the tenant and say, these are the things that we had to charge you from your security deposit. And here's the balance. And they're gonna be typically upset at the balance amount, but you need to have all that documentation. It'll mitigate a lot of dispute later. Trust me on this. Make sure that part of your fees are non-refundable so that they can cover things like, like cleaning, painting, and carpet cleaning on move out. There's no such thing as a non-refundable deposit. Think of that. A deposit is a deposit. You have a non-refundable fee and a deposit. And so make sure those are super clear and your tenant understands what those are being used for at the beginning, during the middle, or at the end. Number five, run a proper criminal and credit background check. So a lot of times landlords just want somebody to move in. This is a mistake that a lot of landlords and managers do because they have pressure on vacancy. They want to get somebody in there right away. And so they say, yeah, somebody shows up, writes a big check, has lots of cash, gives them the cash, and the next thing they know, they have a nightmare on their hands. So the minute that you tell a resident that you're going to run a criminal background check, which by the way, they pay you for, they're gonna pay you say $50 for, 
for you to run their credit. No different than if you're buying a car or you're buying a house and they run your credit. It's the exact same process. You're trying to make sure that you're finding out everything about them and that they have the ability to pay and they don't have a lot of outstanding debt. And even if they do, that's okay. You can still work on those things, but you need to know and you need to have that conversation. And those can turn into things like extra deposits or extra rent, et cetera. There are plenty of rental screening websites out there, so just go find a good one. And don't forget, the resident pays you to run their own credit. So I don't know why you would skip this very, very important step. I always say trust, but verify. The sixth thing and the last thing is fix what's broken. Now this might seem rather obvious. If you want quality tenants, you have to be a quality landlord, period. If something is broken, fix it ASAP. If your resident calls you, you need to fix it right away and let them know when it's going to be fixed. You need to have a handyman on speed dial that can take care of residents' needs immediately. When you do this, the resident will be happy, they'll see that you're responsive, and when you come to the end of your lease, they're probably gonna renew because you were a good, responsible landlord taking care of their needs along the way. Remember, they're paying you rent and you have an obligation to them too. Of course, you gotta make sure that the problem is legit. And in many cases, you might even be able to do it yourself or talk them through it over the phone, but that's just good customer service. The one thing that I would highly recommend is that you never let a tenant do their own work, do their own paint. It's your place, you need to control all of that. Unless, of course, they're like a licensed plumber or a licensed electrician and they can do some of the work themselves. But even then, I would find out exactly what it is they're gonna do, get it in writing so you have it in your paperwork and you have it in your documentation. I did this on one of my rentals where I had a very, very good tenant that was a licensed plumber. He wanted to install a water softener. I had him write it up, bid it up. I had him go get the water softener at Home Depot. He installed it himself and I knocked off 100 bucks off of his rent. That's a win-win. So if you follow these six landlord basics, you will be well on your way to being a successful landlord. And thanks for listening.